say it didn't get a very good acceptance. He's the very one they needed. Because their fish are going to captivity. And their fish to be stripped. And their lands fish to be leveled to the ground. And the lovers they, they ran after are going to be the ones that are going to bring them into captivity. See, God says, I can't leave you in that condition. You must repent of your adulteries. You've got to be removed. You, those whoredoms have to be removed out of your life. The spirit of whoredom, the spirit of Ahab and Jezebel have to be defeated in Israel. They have to be defeated in the church. but she shall not overtake them and she shall seek them but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband for then was it better with me than now. That's exactly what God wanted. That's exactly what God was after. He said, I'm going back to my first husband because it was a lot better with him than it is now. Give God praise in this house. I'm going to tell you something. I pray to God. That everybody here has got this lesson already down. That you're not going to leave the church and go and try to check it out. I pray to God now that you already got this revelation. That it's better with him than it is with that. It's better in the church than it is outside of the church. Thank God. Thank God. He said, I'm going to bring her back to her first beginnings. I'm going to bring her back to her first love. I'm going to bring her back to her first husband. He said, I'm going to lure her in the wilderness. I'm going to take her back, right? Just like Egypt. When I first got her out of Egypt and redeemed her, and then I married her at Mount Sinai. He said, I'm going to take her back to that same place of wandering in the wilderness so that she will return back to her first husband. Are y'all with me right now? God, some, God's got to sometimes... Take you all the way back to where he found you. In a wandering wilderness. In a howling wilderness. In a place of destitution. In a place where you can't find love. God's going to take you back there. To get you back here. Give the Lord praise in the house. And that's exactly what he's going to do. He said... Thank you, brother. Verse 8, for she did not know that I gave her corn. Look at this. He said, I was the one that gave her corn and wine and oil and multiple silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. She didn't know it. I think she knew it, but she didn't believe it. All those blessings came from God. The blessings I have in, your, in my life, the blessings you have in your life came from God. Her provision's been stripped, her security's been stripped, her lovers have been stripped out of her life to bring her back to God. And she'd get a revelation of who it was that did. That loving husband, that loving father to a son. Verse 9, therefore, Will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. I'm going to take all of that away from her. And now I will discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and none shall deliver her out of my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to see her feast days, her new moons and her Sabbaths and all her solemn feasts. I will destroy her vines, her fig trees, whereof she has said, these are my rewards that my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest and the beast of the field shall eat them. He said, I'm going to cause her feast to come to an end because she's using those feasts to celebrate false gods. He said, I'm going to bring her celebrations to an end. They're nothing but lewdness. He's going to destroy the fig trees. These are pictures of security. He's going to take all of that away. No reason to celebrate. No reason to sing. Nothing to sing about. 
no security. Land is there. The Bible says, verse 13, I will visit upon her the days of Ali, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked her. See, she prayed. She prayed, but she prayed to them. Burned incense to them. She decked herself with her earrings, her jewels, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, saith the Lord. She dressed just like a harlot. She put a harlot's clothes on. She put a harlot's jewelry on. Just like that harlot on the back of the scarlet colored beast. Let me tell you something. You don't have to always have a great spiritual discernment. You don't have to be a prophet to look at somebody and know what system they're a part of. Because this is a virgin bride I'm preaching to. This is a pure holy bride I'm preaching to. But it doesn't take much for you to notice what the harlot looks like, the harlot church system. Because they dress like, they look like, they walk like, they act like, and they talk like a harlot. Give God praise in this house. He said, therefore, behold, I will allure her. And bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. In, in, ultimately, in Revelation chapter 12, we know that he take, in the tribulation period, he's going to call her into the wilderness. In Revelation 12. Study, read it sometime. I don't have time to preach it all to you tonight. But Revelation chapter 12 will give it to you. Are y'all with me tonight? Yeah. This has a future application prophetically. God's going to take them into the wilderness. He's going to take them into Petra. This Jesus, who is their one God, who has gone up into heaven, is going to return. And he's going to find them in the wilderness of Petra, of Jordan. And they're going to return to God before the kingdom may be set up. He said, I'm going to lure her into the wilderness. I'm going to get her all by myself. I'm going to get her in a place of solitude. I'm going to get her in a place where she can't find her lovers. I'm going to get her in a place where she is only, God is saying, it's only me and her. It's only God and Israel. It's only Jesus and Israel. Are y'all with me right now? That's what's so good about this fasting and prayer that we went through not long ago, uh, this last few, three days, uh, is that God got us in a solitude place, in a wilderness place, where he had us all by himself, where we prayed and we got in his word. Hallelujah! He said, I'm going to take you back where it all started. I'm going to take you back to the wilderness. I'm going to take you back to an Egyptian, to an Egypt type experience. I got you all to myself. See, a lot of times when you go through a wilderness experience in your life, you say, Oh, God. God's just saying, I'm trying to put you in solitude. I'm trying to get your attention undivided. I'm trying to get you to a place where you'll start looking to me. You'll start walking with me. You'll start seeking me. You'll start worshiping me. Well, all you can do is look up. You... <laughs> he said, then I'll hear that. Right, praise the Lord. No need. When he does this, he's going to speak comfortably unto her. He's going to tell her how much he loves her. Hosea is going to tell Gomer how much he loves her. God's going to tell Israel how much he loves her. Are y'all with me today? He said, I'll give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. He said, I'm going to give you the valley of Achor for a door of hope. In Joshua chapter 7, the Bible talks about a man by the name of Achan. Achan took the first fruits that belonged to God. The first fruits of Jericho, a wedge of gold, some silver, and a Babylonian strum, and he hid it in, in his tent. And God had told them that the whole thing belongs to him. That Jericho was God's first fruits, and nobody was to take any of that for themselves. It belonged to God. It was under a ban. It was under a curse. That if anybody took the first fruits that belonged to God out of Jericho, they would be killed. And Achan. Didn't believe. And Achan got the gold and the silver and the Babylonian garment and he hid it in the tent and his family knew about it. They were accomplices to his sin because the law would forbid that an innocent person.
person would suffer for the guilt of another. But in Joshua chapter 7, the Bible says they took Achan and all his family outside the camp, stoned them to death, and then burned them with fire. So it wasn't just Achan that knew about the sin. His whole family in the tent was involved with the sin. And so God says, in that valley of trouble, the valley of Acre, he said, I'm going to make that a door hole. That place where sin was judged and that place where sin was removed. He said, that will become your door of victory and that will become your door of conquest. But you got to judge the sin. you got to remove the Achans from your midst. And then God can open a door of victory in your life. Valley of Acre, which is a valley of trouble, he said, I'll give you a door of hope. A door of hope. Amen. Just like they removed Achan and sent out of the camp. And the next thing they saw was victory. After they got the sin out of the camp, after they got the sin out of the church, the door of hope was swung wide open, and they went into great conquest and great victory. And this is what God has said to Israel. In that place of judgment, he said, I'm going to turn that place into a door of hope. Now bring some spiritual application to yourself. God is able to take that valley of acorn, that valley of trouble, and turn it into a door of hope. Hallelujah. But you've got to get some unfaithfulness out of you. You've got to get that part of system out of you. Praise God. Hallelujah. God's calling you to one God. He's calling you to a holy life. He's calling you to separate yourself. that place where sin has been judged, the door is open of hope. Give God praise. Oh, what an awesome God. See, he still loves her. He still loves old Israel. Are you here with me today? Gomer still loves hope. Uh, Hosea still loves hope. Oh, but I'm going to bring you, I'm going to tell you, i got to get you out of the wilderness all by yourself, though, so I can get your attention. You've been prostituting yourself long enough. Hallelujah to you. Give God praise in the house. So I'll read to you again, verse 15, so you know where I am. Chapter 2, verse 15. And I will give her her vineyard from thence in the valley of Acor, which is a valley of trouble, for a door hole. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. And in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt, says, I'm taking her back where it all started. And I'm going to get her to a place where she's worshiping me again, where she's singing again. Hallelujah to the Lord. And he says, and it shall be that that day, that saith the Lord, that thou shalt not call me, that thou shalt call me Ishii. And shall call me no more Bali, Baali. You see, because Baal means Lord or Master. And in the Old Testament, I can show you where God was called Baal, Lord, Master. But because they were worshiping false gods named Baal, God says, I've got to take the remembrance of that false god out of you. I've got to take it so far away from you that I'm not even going to let you pronounce the name again, even though it means Lord and Master. I don't want you to even remember the name of that false god anymore. So you're not going to call me Baali anymore. You're going to call me Ishi. You're going to call me Husband. You're not going to call me Baali. You're going to remove the name of that false god far from you. Give God praise in the house. God is saying, I'm going to get the idolatry out of you. I'm going to get the fornication out of you. I'm going to get the spiritual adultery out of you. I'm going to get the unfaithfulness out of you. You're not even going to know the name of that God anymore. You're going to have one, one husband. One God. And that day, will I make a covenant for them, for the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven, with the creepy things of the ground. 
I will break the bow and the sword and the battle of the earth. And will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth the end of me forever. Say forever. Amen. Yeah, I will betroth the end of me in righteousness and in judgment. Say righteousness Amen. and in judgment. Amen. They're going to do right and they're going to do just. And in loving kindness. Covenant loyalty. Loving kindness. Hess says covenant loyalty. Justice and righteousness and covenant loyalty. He said, that's what I'm after. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And thou shalt know the Lord. Say praise the Lord. Lord. They're going to know the Lord. What's his name? Jesus. 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 It shall come to pass in, say, that day. That term, that day, means the day of the Lord. It means the second coming of Jesus. In that day, they're going to know the Lord. In that day, they're going to know that Jesus is the Lord. Are y'all with me today? In that day, they're going to come under one head, like the first chapter says, with one leader over them. And he's going to resurrect David. And David's going to be a co-reigner with Jesus the Messiah. In that day, the kings of age. And Israel will be the head of the nation again. Shall hear the corn and the wine, the oil, and they shall hear, they shall hear Jezreel gathered, sown by God. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her. Oh, yes, he, he's reversing Lohima and Loruhama. Now he says, they're going to be my people, and I'm going to be their God, and I'm going to have mercy upon them. Give God praise in the house. And I will say to them, which are not my people, they are my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. You know who's talking right there? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes back the second time, he's going to tell them, I am your God. Thou art my people. They shall say, Thou art my God. Just like it ends in the first chapter. The Jezreel, which was scattered, now regathered, and Lo Ruchamah, not pity, now pity. Uh, uh, are you with me? Ruchamah, and Lo am I, not my people. Now it's reversed. Now they are my people. God is saying, That's what I'm going to do with Israel. See, God still loves old Israel. He's still got a plan for old Israel. He's not done with her yet, but she's going to have to be stripped of her institutions. Are y'all with me right now? Until she gets so desperate that she cries out for God. Chapter 3. And when I finish this chapter, then I'm going to jump. Because I know there's no way I can read or preach the whole book to you. uh, Every verse. But chapter 3, then what God says to Hosea. He said, I'm going to show you how we're going to accomplish this, okay? She's going to go into captivity. I must bring her to repentance. I've got to take her back to her first love. But it's going to be by way of redemption. But I first have to, like I've taught, like he said here, I've got to call her to repent. (laughs) Chapter 3, we see her. Gomer stripped naked in an auction block of sin. She's seen in chapter 3 as a slave. With no clothes on. The Lord looks at Hosea the prophet. And says. Go buy her back. Go redeem her. Hallelujah. To the Lamb. Now listen to me church. Don't you close the ears to what I'm preaching to you. If you close your ears. You know the prophet Joel that follows this prophet right here. He shows you what happens to people who close their ears. To the warnings of the prophets. You better be careful. God's not going to give you a lot of chances. He still loves you, but you better avail yourself of the truth. Chapter 3, then said the Lord unto me, Go, yet love a woman, but love her for friend, yet an adulteress. Go love a woman, be loved of her friend. Hosea, 
You love her. You're her husband. You're her friend. God loves old Israel. He's her husband. But he's also her friend. They go and love a woman. Beloved of her friend, he's an adulteress. See, now she's not just a prostitute, she's an adulteress. Because she abandoned Hosea. And Israel abandoned God. According to the love of the Lord. Say, according to the love of the Lord. See, Hosea had the love of God in him, Brother Patrick. He had the love of God in him. When Gomer abandoned him, the love of God was working in him for Gomer. The love that God had for old Israel was working in that prophet Hosea. The love of God. The faithfulness of the prophet was working in him. The faithfulness of God. He says, you go and love that woman. She's an adulteress. According to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. Look at this. It's a picture of God's love for Israel. Who looked you to other gods and loved flagons of wine. False gods. Erotic. Offerings. He says, okay, so what did he do? What did he do? What did he do? He does what God says. He gets 15 judges of silver. He gets an omer and a half of barley, which equals 30 pieces of silver. 15 pieces of silver, an omer and a half of barley, another 15 pieces of silver, which is 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of a dead slave. So Hosea, take in your hands the money of redemption. 30 pieces of silver. 15 pieces of silver and an omen and a half of barley. And go and buy that woman off the auction block of sin that stripped her. Whose master is the devil. It's me. In case you don't know it, it wasn't just old Israel standing there. That was you and me standing there. We were stripped naked. We were destitute. We were in sin. And Satan was our master. And we were standing on the auction box of sin. Naked for everybody to stare at us. And everybody to look at us. Gomer. That's me standing. That's you standing. And the Lord Jesus came. And purchased a dead slave. Just like you and me. 30 pieces of silver you betrayed for. And that's all the, also the price of a woman. And he saw you on that slave block of sin. And your devil, and the devil was your master. And Jesus said, I'll buy her. I'll buy that naked slave that's stripped by her master. I'll take her to myself and I'll love her. How y'all here with me? Praise God. Are you with me? Give God praise in the house. And so, it's exactly what he did. For a homer of barley and a half, homer of barley, homer and a half, and 15 pieces of silk, he bought her. What a day that must have been. When that woman who had been unfaithful to Hosea, standing there naked, destitute, in the slave market. When the bid started, it didn't go very high. Because, you see, sin makes you ugly. And the auctioneer began to cry out, who will give me this? As far as I know, nobody did. But that abandoned husband lifted his hand. And said, I'll give you 15 pieces of silver and an homer and a half of water. And they sold her to her husband. Can you imagine how she must have felt? That he would still love her after everything that she had done to him. He took her home. He said, you're going to stay in my home? And you're not going to come in contact with another lover. And he said, Hosea said to Gomer, I'm not going to touch you for a period of time. There won't be any intimacy between Hosea or Gomer. She'll be alienated for a period of time. She can't touch her lovers. 
And she can't have sexual relationships with her husband. That's exactly what's going to happen to Israel. They're going to be alienated from God for a period of time in Syrian captivity. Until God is absolutely sure that all of that adultery, that unfaithfulness is the out of old Israel. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Give God praise. So he says, verse 3, he said unto her, Thou shalt not die for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for man. So I also be for thee. He said, he's not even going to go in and her. He's going to and they alienate her. Exactly what's going to happen to Israel until they get the harlotry out of them. Syrian captivity. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now watch this. This is a powerful prophetic word. Because he goes on and says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days. Notice it doesn't tell you the time frame. It says just many days. Most of the time when God talks about time frame in an area of prophecy, he gives specific time frame. But here he just says many days. He doesn't say how long. But he says many days they shall be without some things. They'll be without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice. Without an image, say an image, which is a false god. Without an ephod, that's a priesthood, and without teraphim, household gods. He said there's going to come a time they're not going to have a king, a prince, they're going to have household gods, they're not going to have gods, they're not going to have a priesthood. Did you catch that? For many days. When did that happen? The ten tribes are taken captive. Judah's going to be taken captive later on by Babylon. And when they do, they'll lose the king. And then when Rome comes in 70 AD and destroys the city and the sanctuary, they're going to lose their prince and the temple. And there will be no more sacrifice and there will be no priest. You're looking at fulfillment of this prophecy right now in this age. Israel doesn't have a king. Israel doesn't have a prince. Israel doesn't have a temple. Israel doesn't have a Levitical priesthood. Israel doesn't have a sacrifice. Israel doesn't have false gods. God delivered them of idolatry. You're living in these days right now. How long will it last? Until he comes back to the earth. You're living in the fulfillment of it right now. Verse 5, afterward, shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, say Jesus, Jesus. and David their king. God's going to raise up David to co-reign with Jesus Christ. They're going to seek God. They're going to seek the Lord, who's Jesus. And David's going to be resurrected to reign in the kingdom of age. Either little, little he's going to be resurrected or David's just another name for Jesus. Give the Lord praise in the house. Isn't that amazing? All right, now I'm just going to hit the high points. I've got to show you how awesome God was to, to Israel. Romans chapter 9. There's never been a nation like her ever in the history of the world. No nation like the nation of Israel in the history of the world. Including the United States of America. She had things that you never had. In Romans chapter 9, look at them. Eight blessings of Israel. <coughs> Romans chapter 9. Are y'all with me today? Yeah. Look at chapter 9 and verse 3. <clears throat> Paul is in sorrow in this chapter because of Israel's rejection of Jesus, the Messiah. Verse 3, he said, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, from my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Who are Israelites? Say Israelites. 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 First blessing. Israelites. Pedigree people. Did you hear that? Israelites. Their daddy, Abraham. Is your daddy's name Abraham? Isaac. Jacob. Any of you have a daddy by the name of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob? These people are Israelites. These are pedigree people. They could say, Abraham's in my genealogy. Ain't nobody here can say that. Other than you can say it spiritually, but not literally. Israelites. 
no nation ever had that kind of blessing. Israelites, to whom pertaineth the option. God said, even though you're few, not because you're large in number, but because he said, I've chosen you. I've adopted you. I've called you my son. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Oh, God never called the United States of America his son. By adoption. And the glory. They had the glory cloud. Can you imagine that? The United States of America has never had the glory cloud. A pillar of fire by day. A cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. This nation's never had the glory cloud. They had the glory cloud. The covenants. Just to mention a few. The Abrahamic covenant. The Davidic covenant. The new covenant. The Palestinian covenant. God gave them the covenants. States of America. As a giving of the law, Moses went up into the top of Mount Sinai. And God gave him the Ten Commandments. Not five on each table, ten on each table. Both tables had ten, ten. God never did that for you. You took his law from them and incorporated in your legal system. God gave them the Ten Commandments, two tables of ten. Woo, glory to God. Moses was their lawgiver. Can you imagine that? Thank you, Jesus. And the service of God. The service of God. Think about the service of God. The tabernacle, the temple, the priesthood, the medical priesthood. Think about that service, how glorious it was in the Old Testament. All those sacrifices, the temple, the priesthood, the tabernacle. Service. Well, God didn't give that to the U.S. He gave that to them. And the promises, the promises of the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead. The promise of the Messiah. You talk about the promises. God didn't come. promise your nation the resurrected king. He didn't promise you from your nation the Messiah would come. We're going to touch on it in just a little bit. And of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is God blessed forever. Amen. I don't know why some of you Hispanics walk around with so much pride. You act like you are God's gift to the human race. Jesus wasn't Hispanic. Jesus was Jewish. And he had a little Gentile in him too. Hallelujah to the Lamb. But are y'all hearing me? They can say that Jesus came from their Lord. And he was none other or none less than God blessed forever. What awesome blessings that God gave them. There's never been a more blessed nation. The world has never seen a more blessed nation than the nation of Israel. Sacrifice that. 
said in verse 5. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God. Jesus and David their king. Either David resurrected or Jesus, the Messiah. Called David. And shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the what? Latter days. See, some of you, I know you want to go home. All you could think about when you got here was, I wonder when I get to go home. I wonder how long he's going to keep us tonight. Well, I'm in the third chapter and I got 11 more to go. <laughs> Somebody ran over my jacket. Give me my jacket. Or give me your, give me your underwear. It's these silk things. That's what I mean. I, mean, I, just, I, just, I just need my handkerchief, man. There you go. You can have your underwear back. <laughs> he likes them silk ones, you know. promise of God of restoration after the captivity and when they come to repentance and in chapter 4 and I'm, I'm going to move quick now he tells them why they're going to be judged he tells them why they're going to go into captivity he breaks it down for them he breaks his complaint down their sin he said this is why you're going to be judged <clears throat> he lets them know they're too deep in sin <clears throat> He hangs tough loving them. There's a glorious future awaiting them. But they're too deep in sin to repent. So he has to judge them. But yet he's torn because he loves them. And the thought of sending them off into captivity with a hook through their lip, the thought of their land being stripped and barren suffering they'll go through. You, you as a husband, even though your wife may have been unfaithful, would you like to see her go through that? He was torn by his love for them, but his government, his righteousness, is all against him. <clears throat> He's in despair. He's distressed. His love is rejected. His love is spurned. You understand something tonight? Rejected love is one of the most painful things that a person can experience. Israel has rejected the love of God and Gomer has rejected the love of Hosea. It's the worst experience that you can experience is rejected love. You see, I want to tell you something. I think you probably know it, but when I love somebody, I love them a lot. And when that love that I have for them is rejected, I fall into a deep despair. So what's wrong with pastor? He's in a deep despair because rejected. like to be faithful and somebody break your heart and reject your love? You know what it's like. That's where they were. They were so deep in sin they rejected his love. Now it's perdition. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here in chapter 4. I will show you their, their problems. Why are they going to be judged? Verse 1, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord have a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. He said, you don't know God. They don't know God. Can you imagine that? 
no mercy. No knowledge of God in the land. Look at 8 verse 2. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Like so many in the church, they say, well, I know God. And God says, you don't know him. And they say, I know God. When they say, I know God, and they don't know God, it's fatal. God is telling them they're so deep in sin, they don't recognize their need to repent. They don't believe. They don't believe they have broken the marital vows. They're still claiming that they know God. And God said, you don't know. See, when a person claims to know God and they don't know God, it's fatal. They lack the knowledge of God. Look at verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because they has rejected knowledge. It wasn't be, because the knowledge wasn't there. Listen. They rejected it. It was given to them. The knowledge, uh, the truth of God was given. But they rejected the truth of God. Half of you did not come to church and claim to know God, but you reject the truth of God. It's not that you don't know. You know. It's that you don't believe. That's why Israel went into captivity. They went into captivity not because they didn't know the truth. They just rejected the truth. They refused to believe it. They refused to respond and move with God. And God said, problem with the lack of knowledge. Verse 10, they shall eat and not have enough. This is the result. They shall, they shall commit whoredoms and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. They've committed spiritual adultery. They're unfaithful to God. You believe that? Amen. Say praise the Lord. Praise spiritual Lord. adultery. They left off to take heed. Just like old Gomer did to Hosea. Abandoned God. Are y'all with me today? Amen. Rejected the knowledge of God. Lacked the knowledge of God. To claim to know God. You hear what I mean? Amen. Unfaithfulness. Rejected love. Unfaithfulness is the most horrible sin that a man can commit. You think about unfaithfulness. You know what, you know what faithfulness is? Faithfulness is trustworthiness. Right. Trustworthy. Faithful is trustworthy. To be unfaithful means you are not trustworthy. Rejected love and unfaithfulness is a horrible sin. It brings more sorrow than any other sin. Sorrow. You get a, a husband that won't take care of his wife, you talk about sorrow. You get a wife that won't take care of her husband, you talk about sorrow. Unfaithfulness, I'll say, is one of the most horrible sins you can commit. It brings sorrow. It brings sin. It brings sickness. It brings a broken heart. It destroys businesses. Churches. It affects pastors. It affects saints. It's a horrible sin. Rejected love. Sperm. Marriages destroyed by unfaithfulness. God. That means God is trustworthy. Look at Hosea. He's trustworthy. He's faithful. Look at God. Trustworthy, faithful. Gomer, unfaithful, untrustworthy. Israel, unfaithful, untrustworthy. Broke the heart of God. Broke the heart of Hosea. Unfaithfulness 
and people will cast you in the deepest despair you will ever experience. You love somebody deeply and they abandon you, it will throw you into depression. It will be hard to break free from it. Spiritual adultery is when you and I are unfaithful to God, that we're in love with the world more than we are in love with God. We love the world system, or we, we love the world religion, or we love the world's fashion more than we love God. And we sit back and we look at all of it, and, and you know, it's okay to have some things. It's not everything's forbidden, but some things are forbidden to have. And we sit around and look and lust after the forbidden things. You are committing spiritual fornication, unfaithful. Spiritual fornication, verse 10. Because they have left off taking heed to the Lord. Verse 12 and 13, physical fornication. They even committed physical fornication. They went up into the high places and committed physical fornication with temple prostitutes to worship the all. Physical fornication. <clears throat> Unfaithfulness is a horrible sin. I've, we've seen it come and go from this house. And sometimes we've had to put some judgments on some things. I'm going to tell you something. You think it was easy? No, it was a horrible sin. It broke some hearts. Separation. Painful. Painful. How many of y'all ever loved and your love was rejected? Raise your hand. You, you had a crush on somebody. Secret crush, and then all of a sudden it became known. And they dumped you hard. They went, ah! ah! You know what I mean? And you love, you just, it tore you to pieces. Resisted God. Well, tell you something, church. It's a horrible sin. For a wife to be unfaithful to her husband and a husband to be unfaithful to his wife. For a church to be unfaithful to God. For business partners to be unfaithful to each other. For friends to be unfaithful to each other. Untrustworthy. Painful. Aren't you glad that Jesus is faithful? He's faithful. That means he's trustworthy. I said he's trustworthy. He kept loving them when they didn't deserve to be loved. He kept loving you when you didn't deserve to be loved. He kept loving me when I didn't deserve to be loved. When you abandoned him, left him, forsook him, he kept loving you. It's time to bring you back. It broke his heart. Amen. But he's trustworthy. Listen, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, I'm, on, I'm almost 50 years old. So I'm starting thinking about my long home. You know what my long home is, right? That's heaven or the new Jerusalem. I'm almost 50 years old. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? And I might look young on the outside. But there's some miles on me and Sister Christine. Hallelujah. Well, today's our 26th anniversary. And by the way, thank you for the cake and the cards. Appreciate it. All right, the signed cards, if that's your name. It's our 26th anniversary. Somebody thought we was our 16th anniversary. I said, well, you need to look again. Because I got a daughter that's almost 18 years old. If it's our 16-year anniversary, I was preaching in the pulpit. There's something not right with that. <laughs> I got an 18-year-old daughter, and we've only been married 16 years. I'm not right with that. So, you know, I'm getting almost 50 years old. We've been married 26 years, hallelujah, and, and I look good on the outside, hallelujah. But I tell you what, I got some miles on this old body, you know. It's mine, the spirit, this heart. It's been through some things, you know what I mean? And, and, and hers as well. Praise God. Yeah, you 
live for God long enough, you're going to go through this thing. You know what I mean. But God is trustworthy. I was thinking of that. That's what I, I almost had a memory lapse. <laughs> I was thinking about it. I'm almost 50 years old, so I'm getting close to my long home. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know when it's going to be. <clears throat> God knows. <clears throat> but I was thinking about laying on my deathbed. The rapture don't come. And leaving my body and going into eternity. Now, if you said it never sit around and thought about that, you need to think about that. Where am I going? Heaven or hell? I'm hoping I'm going to heaven, but what's my guarantee? He's trustworthy. Yeah. Genesis three fifteen. He gave a promise, the seed of the woman, right after the fall. The seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. And he kept his promise. He told Noah it was going to rain a great flood to build an ark. And he'd be saved if he did. And God kept his promise. He told Abraham, you're going to have a son. God kept his promise. He's trustworthy. If I lay on my deathbed, I believe I can trust him. I'm going to go out into eternity knowing where I'm going. Why? Because he's trustworthy. Amen. If he kept his promise to Abraham, if he kept his promise to Noah, if he kept his promise to Abraham and Isaac, Abraham, I know he'll keep his promise to me. I can lay down tonight. Sister and I go to sleep because he's trustworthy. In Peter 3, he's not slack as some men count slackness. He's trustworthy. And God says, you're fallen and you've committed spiritual adultery. You've left him. Hold him. Committed hold him. Verse 10. And that's how it also takes you today. And then he says, give you a picture of sin, whoredom, and wine, new wine, take away the heart. He said, you're drunk with new wine. You're drunk, it takes away your heart. Spiritual adultery and drunkenness. And then he says, in verse 13, they sacrifice upon the tops of mountains, burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms because shadow thereof is good. The shadow is good. So they went up in the top. They enjoyed themselves. The shadow is good. It's good to be here, they said. This is the New Testament. God will bless your life, but never exchange the worship of God for your blessing. That's the problem with the church world today. They're not faithful to God. They're not faithful to the church. They're more faithful to the blessings of God than they are the blesser. Listen to me. I want to get up in the shadow because it feels good. Let me tell you something. That's the problem with religion today. It's a feel-good religion. If it, come on. As long as it feels good, I'll serve God. No, you can't just serve God when it feels good. You've got to serve God when it gets hard. Hallelujah. You're not looking for a shade tree to crawl up underneath every time, every opportunity you get. What God says, that's what I want. What God says, that's what I want. Well, I'll quit the church and move off to paradise. I'll move up and sh hey, all right, praise God. You better make sure it's God. He told you to go there. I want to be a missionary. You know what I want to be a missionary to? I want to be a missionary to Hawaii. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You come up to me and you say, I'm going to be a missionary to Hawaii. I'm going to tell you, shut up, sit down. <laughs> You're just looking for a better shade tree. <laughs> it was comfortable, made them comfortable. You know, that's what the, the church was looking for today, just to be more comfortable. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you serve God, it's not going to be under a shade tree. They up in them trees, committing all kinds of fornication and adultery and all kinds of ungodliness. And God said, I'm going to judge it. Bunch of drunken harlots looking for an easier life, looking for an easier way. I'm not looking for an easier way. I'm looking for God's way. I'll give you 
get an easier way when I go to heaven. Sometimes living for God, Brother Mark, is hard. It's not always easy. So think about where you're going. Physical fornication. Verse 16. Another problem. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. I'm really going to have to do it. They're sliding back like a backsliding heifer. Say a backsliding heifer. God called Israel and said, You're a backsliding heifer. How would you like if God called you a backsliding heifer? I like to put some emphasis on heifer. <laughs> you know what a backsliding heifer is a picture of? It's a lack of growth. They had a lack of knowledge, now they got a lack of growth. A backsliding heifer. You know what a backsliding heifer is? You've got to put them, put, put them up in a trailer. Hallelujah. <laughs> they lock their front foot hoofs down like this, and they start sliding back down the ramp. Why? Because they locked their foot down. I'm not going. I'm not moving. I'm staying. <laughs> Come on, I've pastored a few people like that. They lock their hoofs down. And they're not heifers, they're bulls. You ain't leading me. I'm not moving. Refuse to be led. Refuse. Lack of growth. Can't lead them. Can't move them. Hallelujah. Just backsliding. It's a picture of their sin. Verse 17. Because they refuse to move, because they've locked their hooves down, they're sliding back. He said, Ephraim, look at it, is joined to idols. Let them alone. Let them alone. Leave them alone. They won't repent, so just leave them alone. If you won't move, God's going to say you're joined to your idols. Let them alone. That means you are lacking dedication. You're joined to other things. You're joined to idols. So you're not dedicated to God. Come on, somebody. If you lock your hoofs down, your, your, your legs down, if you won't move, you'll just slide back. You won't be led. You refuse to move. Then the next step is you're joined to your idols, and God's going to leave you alone because you refuse to have dedication in your life. And as a result of that, they, their drink is sour. They have committed whoredoms continually. Her rulers with shame do love. They just kept on committing their whoredoms. You know why? Because the first whoredom didn't satisfy. So they went to another whoredom, and it didn't satisfy. So they went to the next whoredom, and it didn't satisfy. So it's a con one continual idol and harlot after another. Are y'all with me here? What he's saying is there's a lack of satisfaction. They just try to find it in another lover somewhere else, but they can't find it because there's no satisfaction outside of God. Don't ever forget what I'm preaching to you today. Give the Lord praise in the house. Your drink will turn sour on you. Woo, Jesus. Somebody throw your hand up like this in Jesus. Yeah. Woo. I gotta hurry. Let's jump down to chapter five. The fix to be judged. Hear ye this, O priest, and hearken, verse one, ye house of Israel, and give ear, you, O house of the king, for judgment is toward you, because you have been a snare of Mizpah and a snare and a net spread upon paper, and the revolters are profound to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuker of them all. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committed whoredom, and Israel is defiled. They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. They will not frame their doings to turn to their God. That means that they lack devotion. Come on, are y'all getting this tonight? They lack devotion. 
They will not frame their doings to turn to their God. They won't get devoted. Let that not be us. Let us frame our doings unto the Lord. Let's be devoted unto God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Chapter 5. The pride of Israel just kept testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah also shall fall with them. So they're full of pride. That means that they're full of pride. Then they lack what? Humility. Humility saying, I need God. Pride saying, I don't need God. Humility says, I need God in my life. I don't have enough God in my life. I'm not going to sit on a pew. I need more of Jesus. I want to give myself to him. Only the humble say that. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, okay. Verse 7. Let's jump to verse 7. They have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for they have begotten strange children. Now shall a month devour them with their portion. Children have been born to them in, in unfaithfulness. Isn't that a sad thing? Strange children. They said they're strange children. They don't act like their daddy. They don't have the characteristics of their daddy. They're strange children born to a heart. Are y'all here today? Let me jump. I know you're getting tired, so I'm not going to try to be too intense to you. Verse 14, I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, so God's going to punish you. And as a young lion to the house of Judah, I even I will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue them. They're going into Assyrian captivity. Let's jump over to chapter 7 real quick. Verse 2. They lack consideration. And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. They lack consideration in their hearts. They don't consider their condition. They don't even believe they're, they, as I said, they don't even believe they've broken the miracle vow. They, 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 would, they said they knew God, and God said they didn't know God. They haven't considered the condition of their heart, chapter 7. Let's go down to verse uh, 4. They are all adulterers as an oven heated by the baker who ceaseth from raising after after he kneaded the dough until it is leavened. They lack separation. You know why? Because there's leaven in their dough. If there's leaven in the dough, that means there's mixture. That means there's no separation. So they lack separation. They're like an, a, a baker who he gets his dough. He puts leaven in the dough. He lets it set all night till the leaven makes the dough rise. And after the leaven makes the dough rise, he gets up early in the morning and he puts it in the hot oven. That's what God says Israel is like. They're full of leaven.